I got you cash. Have a bunker. <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> it's still in Dripping Springs. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, good evening. Don't have to do that. Oh, no, I like that. Last time it was me. <laughs> no. Oh <my> gosh. <laughs> so good. Right, right. Revolving. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> all right. Good evening, everyone. This is now the second session. Uh, we're trying to discuss the book, The Lord of Spirits by Father Andrew Damick. Um, we are going to just start now on chapter one. Last time we went through the foreword and the introduction. Um, and so this is not meant to be a lecture by your priest. This is meant to be a discussion. Okay, so we'd like everyone to chime in. So who found odd this idea that gods with a little g means lots of things? Well, we're all, as Orthodox, we're all somewhat familiar with the concept of theosis. Right. But he he kind of hammered it home, put a nail into it, you know. Uh, and it, the fervency which he forward his his argument about it kind of took me by surprise a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, then again, it didn't surprise me, you know. Okay. It just the. Uh, The case he made for it was a little more in depth than I thought, you know. Right. Okay. okay. So, um, as modern people, we're used to thinking there's one God and none other. Okay. And while that is true, doesn't mean that there's not other spiritual entities including human beings um, that were made by God that are therefore gods. Um, so at the time that all the scripture was written, there were pagans everywhere, right? And so the question wasn't, do you believe in gods or a God, but what God do you believe in? Um, it's actually, I think, a function of Protestantism that we now have atheists that are um, so resistant to God that you can't have a discussion with them. Um, I've heard it said that um, many Protestant groups are uh, vaccines against truly understanding God, right? So as the vaccine work, you get a little bit of something that's dead, and then when it, the real thing comes around, you won't get it. If you get a little bit of a dead God, you're not going to get the real God when he comes around because you're not, you're going to be totally uh, uh, oblivious to what's going on there. Okay. Um, so he didn't say that, but that was something that came to my mind as I read this. Um, so it also, this, this book about how we are all gods, um, you know, we're intended to be God. Um, makes much more sense of the saying that's attributed to St. Athanasius. He's lived in the fourth century that uh, God became man so that man might become God. Um, and now when we write that out, we use, you know, big G for the first God and little G for the second God. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, in his mind, um, that wasn't such a weird thing, right? It's weird for us because we're, uh, we're post-Protestants, you know, <laughs> even though we're Orthodox, we're also post-Protestant. Um, and so we, we've got this infection that we have to try to bleed out of our systems. And that's why I think that Father Damick was so uh, impassioned, you might say, with his uh, this whole first chapter on God's means a lot of things, you know, it's yeah. not just big G God. OK, uh, otherwise. Uh, and so, um, you know, and he does drive that home. But, you know, think about uh, all the different ways that big g god is talking about in the old spirit you know the lord of lords and host of hosts you know well, why would we have to say lord of lords if there wasn't other people that or other entities that might be called gods or lords right um so another big point different point um is that Pagan gods always had successions, right? 
So um, Zeus is the most high Greek God, uh, conquered his father who conquered his father in turn. Okay. Uh, in the Babylonian um, uh, pantheon, uh, the original God was a, a female goddess, uh, Tiamat of the ocean, right? And so Marduk, the uh, God of Babylon, kills Tiamat, cuts her in half, right? Divides the waters from the waters and uh, the dry lands appear and people are created, okay? So the gods didn't create things they move things around, they change things, but they're not creator gods the way our God is the creator of all things. They're just not that kind of gods. They're not that kind of beings, right? There's no myth of Zeus or any of his father creating everything from nothing. Right? It's just not part of their understanding of the way the, way the world works. Um, and so the Hebrew God is a very different God than all these other gods, okay? Um in, I believe it's, it's either in Isaiah or Jeremiah. Um, he says that, uh, you know, I'm the Lord uh, and there were no other gods before me. and There'll be no other gods after me. So that is completely uh, dispelling this idea that there's a succession of powerful gods. If there's only one God. It's always been only one God. There only always will be only this one God. Okay. It's not something that comes and goes like the pagan uh, pantheon, okay? Um, so that's that's a very different way of looking at things. And so one way of looking, especially Genesis, is what is going on in Genesis is God, by talking to Moses, is telling him the way things really were, really are, to dispel or correct all the pagan myths so you know that's why it starts um so there's a um the babylonian uh creation story it's called enuma elish uh because those are the first two words of the story in whatever it is uh, the ancient semitic language that was written in um where we get these uh stories of uh marduk and tiamat and all, all this kind of stuff um, and Moses and the Hebrews and, you know, Abraham and all would have been familiar with all those stories. Okay. Um, and so Genesis is God's way of correcting our understanding of how things come about okay? that it wasn't, uh, Moses writing down, sitting down on a blank slate and, you know, receiving dictation from God. It was, we have these stories, but they don't make sense with this God that you're telling us about, Moses. Well, this is how it really happened. And all those things that you thought were the gods doing thing were not actually these pagan gods doing anything. They can't do anything, right? Look at them now, right? They sit in temples, and if they fall over, they can't pick themselves up. And, you know, you bring them food, but then you eat it all, Um so these gods aren't really anything. Um, and yet they, they still have um, persuasive power, right? Um, and so that's why it's important that we understand that demons can be God as little g gods as well, okay? They're spiritual beings. Um, in Genesis, it talks about uh, dividing the people into 70 nations. Okay. Um, there, Israel is not one of those nations. Okay, S but each of the nations gets uh, assigned a guardian angel. Um, the guardian angels then, some of them uh, fell probably of their own uh, desire. Some of them fell because of the way the people started worshiping worshiping them. So rather than passing that worship on to the true God, they accepted that worship for themselves. And that's how angels fall into becoming demons. You take what's God's and make it your own. God's apostrophe S, not plural S. Um, take what is truly belongs to God 
and you try to make it your own. That's what makes the demons, right? Um, so, you know, every evil is not anything of itself. It's only the corruption of something good, okay? So we don't believe that there's, quote, evil as a force, but beings can uh, become evil and spread evil, okay? Whether they're gods, angelic beings, uh, which we now call demons, or people, right? Um, people who take everything good and corrupt it to their own will and their sa own satisfaction um, are in league with the demons. They're doing what the demons want them to do because they're taking good things and turning them uh, away from the good and turning them to their own uh, their own benefit. Um, you know, um, so um, all of that's rolling around here in in this uh, uh, unstated, I think, behind what we do get here in this first chapter about God and gods. So comments is that throw uh, spikes in your in your roadway. <laughs> no. Okay. no, I just it was eye opening because I never really considered you think about pagan gods. I just never considered that maybe there was a demon behind that. Right. An right. actual entity. Yeah, an actual entity. That, right. That uh -huh. you know that was there. Right. It was just made of stories. Right. But, um, you know, so Probably some were, but there was probably also the, you know. Right. Um, so, for instance, the Greeks didn't sit around and say, look at that light, you know, streaking across the sky. Let's make up a story to explain that, right? <laughs> you know, they uh, it comes about a completely different way. So part of that is, you know, our uh, 20th century public school brainwashing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which we're all victims of, um, that people who don't understand the real God and don't understand scriptures can't possibly teach children how to understand gods, right? Um, and to extent that before 1964, whenever it was, uh, you might have some people that actually tried to talk about God in school, you know, after whenever it was, uh, then you couldn't talk about couldn't talk about God in school. Could, teachers couldn't do anything. Um, then certainly that opens the door to people who have no understanding. Uh, and and it's so the, the firm belief with both God and and some others that other issues like that is if you don't believe in the true God, it's not that you're going to believe in nothing, but you'll believe anything and everything. You have no bounds to the uh, what you believe. Uh, which we now see played out, you know, where um, people are actually arguing in, in public schools now about whether it's okay to have uh, an after school group that's uh, demon worshiping. <laughs> it's like they're Satan worshiping, you know, uh, because they have no foundation that well, it's, it's, it's okay because it's not God, it's not religion. <laughs> well, you said at the beginning about atheists, I've, I've, I've never really met one true hardcore atheist we, i didn't really know it was a, kind of a co-worker's wife uh -huh. but what i found interesting was if anybody brought up anything even remotely christian mm -hmm. she would fly off the handle right she couldn't take any right to talk of you... it it would drive her insane right it was really oh, wow. odd it was a right. weird phenomenon i mean she would lose her temper right so it, you know, sitting back here, not having met the woman or seeing these outbursts, it strike me, we would say, of course, she's demon possessed because she's totally dropped her guard and allowed them in and she doesn't even know she's allowing them in. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I didn't know what to do with it besides I just <laughs> countered up to uh, she's just so insecure uh -huh. that that's the only way she could convince herself was to yell louder. Right. Do an exorcism. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I'm thinking she needs to. Be gone, you spirit. Oh man. Right. right. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so I thought it was interesting. I guess <clears throat> I'm pretty sure I've read this at some point uh, on page 21 and 22 about from Isaiah, the, the fall of Satan. Um, mm. So that's that's now in my uh, quiver of arrows, you know, that, um, to talk about the um, the fall of Satan, um, and it's interesting. Uh, Daystar, son of the dawn, is very similar to uh, words we use to describe Christ. Right, he's the morning star yeah. um, who rises in the east. Well, but. <laughs> Son of the dawn is what rises in the east, right? Uh, so, um, you want to read? Do I want to read it? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, so, how are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How are you cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I'll set my throne on high. I will sit on the mountain of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I'll ascend above the heights, the clouds. I'll make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Okay. Um, so. So that's describing the devil. Yeah. Right. Um, and so if you've uh, got the book in front of you, you'll notice that there's a close quote uh, here at the uh, end of, I will make myself like the most high, close quote. But you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. That's God's reply to all of this oh, okay. uh, boasting by um, Satan as the day star. Um, so um, most of us think about Satan and the demons falling um, before the creation of the world or before men become around. Um, but that's actually a John Milton thing, again, a Protestant thing that disrupts our ability to understand the scripture because we have now this image in our mind that we don't pick up on these things like this is just here. This is Isaiah. I mean, this is already, uh, let me think, he's second temple uh, time period. So this is 500 BC as opposed to you know, Moses, who was probably 1500 BC, uh, 1100 BC. I mean, you get all kinds of uh, estimates of when Moses might have lived, but uh, at least half a millennium before Isaiah and probably farther longer before than that. Um, and when in Luke's gospel, when Jesus sends out the 70 apostles two by two, uh, to go preach in the, the land of Judea, they all come in, come back, and then Jesus says, I saw Satan falling from the sky. Uh, so when when was it? Well, um, it's happened probably, it's an event that happens outside of time, probably, at least time as we know it. So we can't peg it, this event, to some time period of human history. This is something that's happened in a spiritual realm, realm where we aren't really there. Uh, so it, you know, it could be both, right? Because it's, if it's outside of time, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can't peg it. You can't put a pigeonhole and say, you know, post it. Here it is. I got finally got you. I got my post it on. You just can't do it. Um, and that's a totally mind blowing, right? You can't really think about that, right? Because we're time bound beings. Um, and so the best we can do, which is why a lot of the uh, prophets have kind of a poetic uh, narration rather than a, a, a prose narration, because you can't understand this stuff directly, logically, um, like it's not like building blocks. It's the wibbly wimey timey wimey stuff. <laughs> For all you Doctor, Doctor Who fans. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm reminded of uh, Pascha Sunday at the uh, Agape Feast 
we sing the Torah and it, it's from the Psalms. Who's so great a God is our God. Ours a God that works wonders. Um, you know, essentially saying all these other gods are, are fake. You know, ours the God. Ours is the God that does this stuff. What I liked is just more an observation for the end of the chapter was uh, you might have touched on this earlier was the idea that our God is the only God that loves right. mankind. Right. If you study, and I love mythology as a right. kid, reading all sorts of mythology, gods were, I mean, every other religion is just, they're manipulative, they're vindictive, mm -hmm. right? They're mean spirited, they're, some of them are just bloodthirsty, they're jealous. I mean, gosh, and you start going into Hindu beliefs, and it's there's some wacky stuff there, and bloodthirst, and you know, yeah. it's the only one I can't think of one that's in any other religion. I was racking my brain when I read that chapter, I was just trying to think of one that was right. a loving pagan god. I can't find one, right? Right. So, I mean, even the quote, God or goddesses of love are very jealous and they right you know turn people into animals and yes all the stories of, and they're i mean they're just yeah yeah always picking on humans and right trying to get their way <laughs> <laughs> so uh which is a cautionary tale for us humans <laughs> you know do we want to be like them right uh or do we want to actually be you know go towards the god of love which is really a hard thing to do which the other thing that I thought about reading this was the idea that if, you know, there's demons, there's these other spiritual beings running around, people are worshiping them throughout history, you know, almost, I guess, the idea of if these are fallen angels or why, you know, why are they allowed to come and go and roam and cause havoc like they are? You know, it seems like Satan, it says, was cast down into hell, mm -hmm. yet he's still roaming around. Right. And so I'm always puzzled by that idea of um, you rebel and you get sent to hell, but then right, it doesn't but, seem to be a lock on that. Place. And I forget where this is, but it's like not all of them are sent and they actually petition God to uh, but some of them stay. Oh, okay. Um, and God, for you know, foreseeing that Adam and Eve would fall into sin, um, allows the demons to tempt us so that we understand what sin is, and that we're not uh, we don't sleepwalk through our lives not understanding. Okay, okay. Um, that because. The demons that are allowed to live are um, influence uh, influence us towards evil, and God's influencing us towards good. Uh, then we actually have to make a choice, okay? And that's what it means to be mortal. That what it means to be human is you. We have to make choices, and the question is fundamentally: Are you going to choose good or evil? Choose God or the demons? And if you didn't know what the demons were, you wouldn't know to make the choice um, and could sleepwalk into the demons, right? Which I think a lot of people are doing anyway. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> so it, um, which is why the Lord's Prayer ends with, and don't, don't put me to the test. You know, uh, which is apparently the more literal translation of that last phrase. It's, you know, don't lead us into temptation is a Hebrew uh, idiom. And the Greek is don't put me to the test. Um, but that's really kind of the the thrust of the Hebrew idiom. Of don't, don't lead me into temptation means don't put that temptation in front of me. Don't put me to the test. Um, and the test is always are you going to choose God or demons? Um, so it, it all it all wraps up as they say <laughs> all right anything else about god gods people as gods uh, okay so what? we do we still have those guardian angels and whatnot they're still there right and uh countries 
are still being prayed for by these little G gods. Right. 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 Um, so. Can they still fall? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so in the book of Daniel, there's an episode where uh, Daniel calls on Archangel Michael and Archangel Michael says, I was delayed because I was fighting with the Prince of Persia. So that the quote Prince of Persia is the uh, fallen angel that was assigned to guard Persia. Mm. And Michael as, you know, so the 70 nations are there. They all get their guardian angels. They All the angels fall by accepting the worship that was due to God and didn't pass it on. And so God creates a new nation, the you know, the Israel. Um, and Michael is the guardian angel of Israel. Um, and so that's why he's fighting with the prince of Persia. Um, still doing it this, to this day. Still doing it to this day. Um, so kind of to talk wrap this all back into some things we were talking about before we got on on the, the zoom here um michael is still the prince of israel the state of israel created by the united nations in 1947 is not israel it's got that name but it's not israel of god okay so think about this you've got you know all the jews in the world in what's now the year zero or actually maybe the year 33 um and christ is crucified christ rises from the dead and so the question then becomes is who is now israel is it the people that are faithful like abraham was faithful to the true god and his son jesus christ risen from the dead well, the people who nailed him to the cross or the, well that's that'd be the romans yeah okay? Or is it the people that reject him as the Messiah, reject the Son of God, and still claim that they're um, Israel? Well, actually, they were, you know, they were Jews. They were the, you know, they they were descendants of Judah. So in 33 A.D., or actually, if we pick 70 when the temple was destroyed, or 135 when the Jews got all kicked out of uh, Palestine. Um, the people, I lost my train of thought here. Yeah. <laughs> Senior moment, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> that those people um, rejected God's Messiah, just like they rejected the prophets. Okay. And so being part of Israel is being an heir of Abraham, where what was accounted to Abraham as righteousness was not being circumcised, but believing in God, believing in the true God. And that's what, you know, talk about the heirs of the promise. And through Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. But the people that we know after 135 AD as the Jews are not those people, right? It, they don't believe in God because God sent his son and they killed him. And they didn't believe in him, and they didn't believe that he was resurrected, and they have no truck with uh, dead people. As you might say. Uh, so, so then is the question: Who are? Who is Israel? Who, who is what group of people is Israel? And we may not know, but God knows. Well, God knows, but sort of as a group, it's the church, right? Okay. And by that, of course, I mean the Orthodox Church, because we're the only ones that's been here from the beginning that has remained unchanged or as unchanged as we can be. Um, you know, we dress different. Uh, so that's a change. But, you know, we still believe in <clears throat> one God. Um, you know, so I was reading just today in, in a letter to Timothy, God wills that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, that sounds like a loving God. I want all you guys to be saved. But yet there's people out here who use the name Christian that don't believe that. Right? So where are they coming from? And they're, quote, Bible-believing Christians. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, in my life, whenever someone tells me I'm a Bible-believing Christian, I said, well, you're a, you know, you're a heretic. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you just don't have it, you know. 
uh, which is a bad, bad wet thing to, to you know, carry around with you. But, um, the people you'd expect to be your allies are probably your biggest enemies. Mm. <clears throat> is what you, the church, uh -huh. is that sort of the basis for why? I have seen more and more things lately popping up where they're trying to get rid of everything that Paul wrote. What what is the basis behind that? Are you familiar with that? Uh, I'm I'm not, but there's been a division for at least 300 years where you divide Christ from Paul and say Paul was <clears throat> um, creating his own thing and was using Christ. It's sort of like oh. So in the terms we've talked about here in this book and what we've talked about tonight is they're saying Paul is a demon who's taking the worship that are due to God and uh, creating his own religion. That's really what they're saying. Oh, that's um, yeah. I've been, I've been too scared to click on any of the videos and watch them because I just thought it's a waste of time. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, it is a waste of time. But I mean, Paul's a great resource for really a, a staunch advocate for the church. Right. The body. I mean, he's right. He talks uh, so much about the church. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, what people forget is that Paul, um, in I believe it's first, first Corinthians, when he talks about the Eucharist, that's the first time anything was written down about the Eucharist and the institution of the Eucharist. So it doesn't, you know, people, our books are divided. You got the four gospels, then you got, uh, acts and then you have Paul's writings. But if you, you know, scale them out on when things were written, Paul would all come first before any of the gospels and maybe mark was written about the lap time that paul finished it, write, his writing um but paul comes first and so when mark and luke especially are writing their gospels they know paul right they both traveled with paul for years they understood paul and what mark and luke write are paul's gospel and so if you try to divide the gospels from paul you're demented. I mean, you can't do it rationally because Mark and Luke were disciples of Paul and what they wrote in their gospels, what they heard Paul talk about for years. This is how it works out. This is how it works out. Uh, so, um, you know, there was a book, it was written probably, uh, boy, at this point, maybe 50 years ago, a guy named Ogmandino. I don't know anything about Protestants, you know, his yeah. name the greatest salesman in the world. And his whole pitch was Paul was a salesman trying to sell people the gospel. And we go, no, Paul wasn't a sales. He didn't have to, you know, it's like the product sells itself, right? <laughs> you don't have to be a salesman. The product sells itself. Uh, so Paul wasn't trying to sell the gospel to anybody. He was trying to proclaim the gospel. This is what it is. Um, so anyway, um, so um, I'm reading a book now on um, Paul. So there's the, sort of the old Protestant view of Paul, and especially what works means in Paul's writings. Um, this is something I didn't know till you know, this last couple of weeks, is that both Luther and Calvin, Calvin um, treated any... Uh, time that Paul talked about works as being uh, works that you might use to earn your way into heaven. And Paul uses works in many ways. He talks about works the law and good works, right? Um, and so when Paul says works the law, he means things like uh, men being circumcised, uh, means about uh, you know, not having a garment with two different kinds of cloth woven and or sewed together. Um, you know, all, you know, um, the various washings that you had to do, purification rituals. Those are the works of the law that Paul says we don't need anymore. Okay. So then uh, starting only about 40 or maybe 50 years ago, uh, you've got the quote new perspective on Paul, where it's like, well, Paul's using these the word works in many different ways and you got to you know put it in context and find out what he's really saying and of course the the best thing is in the book of galatians where it says uh we're saved by grace not by works lest that any man should 
uh, boast, but we are created for good works. Oh, which works do you mean where, you know? So if you have no, if you're just going to make all works works, and since you're say you're not saved by works because you're created for something that doesn't exist or something you shouldn't do. Well, how does that work? You know, it, it's a nonsensical reading of, of Paul. Um, and the new perspective on Paul is closer, but it still comes with, you got to have all this Protestant baggage to carry with you when you come into the, into Paul. You know, it's like you're uh, a porter uh, on the old railway station where you've got to have a hand cart <laughs> to get all this stuff down the, the platform, you know? Uh, it's, I didn't it's, realize it had been going on for that long. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you have to really pay attention to the context of what, when Paul says works, is he saying works the law? saying good works, you know? Um, so, you know, even the Galatians thing, you know, um, you're not saved by works less than any man should boast. So it's not like uh, ticket punchers, you know? Uh, I guess that became a common parlance during the Vietnam War that uh, to advance in, in the army, especially you had to do uh, X amount of time in this position and X amount of time in that position. Uh, tick, getting your ticket punched. You had to do all these different jobs um, if you were ever expected to make general, right? Uh, and so in Vietnam, you had all these guys that were, you know, well, you have to lead an infantry battalion for six months. So they'd work for six months in, in Vietnam and then they'd come back to the States because they had their ticket punch. They had that, you know, on their resume. I've now led a battalion for six months. Um, and some people treat salvation like that. If I punch all the right tickets, it doesn't matter if my heart's black as coal. It's okay because my ticket is punched. Okay, and that's what Paul says. It's not like that at all. Okay, but you're created for good work. So, the whole idea is, you know, we're as Christians, we're little Christ. Okay, and so we're supposed to emulate Christ. And what's Christ? He's love, right? Because God is love. God, you know, sent His uh, Son into the world. Not to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. Well, that's a loving act. So if you're going to be a Christian, a little Christ, you got to do loving acts. And those are what Paul calls good works, that you're made to do good works. And so if you're not doing what you're made to doing, you're not true to your own nature. So all of that's wrapped up in works and all that's wrapped up in Paul. And the different way people see Paul, because rather than understanding that Paul came first, they try to divide Christ and Paul. But you can't do that, right? Because how does Paul even come to Christianity? Christ himself <laughs> interrupts his, his right. journey, this big <laughs> vision. And, and then Paul goes into the desert for, I forget how many years, three years, five years, seven years, something like that. Uh, and then he comes back and only talks to Peter, James. And then he goes back out to the desert. Well, he was doing that because he was a monk. He was trying to understand this vision. He's, you know, communing with God. He's praying to God uh, and understanding what this vision was. Um, and then he comes back. And then he's the great preacher because he's been in communion with God in the desert as a monk and not being distracted by the world. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I thought he was whacked on the side of his head per se. And then he went right into no, no. preaching and teaching. That's what I thought too. No, 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 no. He, so he starts preaching in Damascus. The people want to kill him. They let him down on a basket outside the walls of Damascus. And that's when he goes off into the desert. Okay. And then he comes back to Jerusalem, only talks to uh, James and Peter. Um, maybe it's James, John, and Peter. Uh, and then he goes back out into the desert. And only after he spent like seven years, I think it is, in the desert, does he come back and start preaching. And the people in Jerusalem can't abide him because they remember when he was, you know, killing their, their brothers. So they sent him off to Antioch uh, with Barnabas. And that's kind of when we get into the beginning of Paul's stories when he goes to Antioch. And the other part about being in the desert, there's just a few things like in Galatians, it talks about being in the desert. Um he was going out there to, you know, be in sort of constant prayer and understand this vision that God has given to him. Hmm. You know, who are you? Well, I'm the guy you're crucifying you know, or you're persecuting. Um, 
So come, let me explain this to you. you know. Let me explain this to you, Lucy. <laughs> uh, so anyway, all right, that's probably enough. Um, so we'll try to tackle chapter two next time, which is on angels and demons. So it may be more of the same. Uh, and we'll see what uh, Father Damick has to say. <laughs> Thank you.